Let's begin. Well, good evening, everyone. I'm Patty Bajabir, Adult and Digital Services Librarian with the Kenosha Public Library. Thank you for joining us as we offer an environmental program, Be Salt Wise and Keep Fresh Water Fresh. Winter is still very much with us. And while living in Wisconsin, it's vitally important to not only stay safe during the season, but to also protect our environment. We are very pleased to have as our guest, Allison Madison, a Sustainability and Development Coordinator with the Wisconsin SaltWise Partnership. I now turn the program over to Allison. Thank you. Thank you, Patty. And thank you everybody from the Kenosha Library that helped make this event possible. So as Patty said, my name is Allison and I started with Wisconsin SaltWise this past June. I am the first ever staff person with Wisconsin SaltWise and working this year to really take the SaltWise message statewide. SaltWise started in the Dane County area, um, but this year in 2021, we hope to be working with communities across the state, including people in Kenosha. So excited to be with you today. I'm gonna to share a few slides. Um, like I said, if you have any questions, um, feel free to share those as we go along. And I can also take other questions at the end. And you can share in the chat as well. So let's see, I am, it says I am screen sharing. Can you guys see though the pictures of salt? Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay, great. So unfortunately, photos like this are all too familiar for us in Wisconsin. Um, signs of excess salting. With Wisconsin SaltWise, our message is not that we can't use salt, but it's we want to be smart about it, be salt wise, and use only what's needed. Because salt is a really powerful tool. And it also has a lot of costs that sometimes to the untrained eye might um, be hidden. But once you start noticing, you know, damage to trees, other vegetation along roadsides and ditches um, and acknowledge that there are costs associated with repairing those, um, noticing corrosion and premature aging of our infrastructure and these figures are costs annually for the country. And we're not necessarily spending over $5 billion a year, but that's how much damage is being done. And in a lot of cases, we're not keeping up with repairing that damage as it happens. And AAA estimates that damage to personal vehicles is around $3 billion a year from salt. And then we might see spalding like this on our concrete. Um, Overall, when you look at the big picture, for every dollar that we spend on salt, there's about $10 of damage to vegetation, cars, infrastructure um, that oftentimes we aren't accounting for. So while salt seems relatively cheap, its true cost comes um, after we pay at the cash register for that salt. And that doesn't even take into account the damage that's done to our freshwater ecosystem. So SaltWise um, would appreciate if all of you continue to help spread the word that the salt that we put down on our pavement, that we put in our water softeners, it doesn't go away. It might appear to as it dissolves into our water. It's clear. Um, you, don't see, you don't see that salt, but it is dissolved in our water. It's a permanent pollutant in that salt does not biodegrade. It doesn't break down. It stays sodium and chloride ions in the water. And that salt can impact the organisms that live there. So naturally in Wisconsin, we have very, very little chloride. Um, in a lot of the state, zero milligrams, no real detectable chloride in our fresh water. Um, but as we've put salt down for the last several decades on our roads, that salt the concentrations are beginning to build up and accumulate in our soils, in our surface water, in our groundwater. Nationally, the EPA sets a level of 230 milligrams 
per liter. Now this is a very small amount, right? Because a gram is like a paper clip, but at 230 milligrams per liter is enough salt to have negative impacts on small aquatic organisms. Um, and those impacts kind of move up and down the food chain. In the, D the DNR in the state of Wisconsin has set the limit a little bit higher, um, but a lot of people still go with this national limit. And you can see here the word chronic and also acute. So chronic is the idea that if you're exposed to this over a long period of time, it's gonna be doing damage. And acute means just for even a short period of time, exposure at that level can do damage. So that acute level that kind of like kill you real fast um, is set at five, seven, excuse me, 757 milligrams per liter. And in the southeastern corners of our state, like Kenosha, um, some of the most urbanized parts of our state, the sewer PC, so this is the Southeastern Wisconsin Regional Planning Commission. They're doing actually a chloride study right now and they're seeing figures of 2,000 to even 3,000 and higher milligrams per liter in our freshwater streams. So our freshwater streams aren't all so fresh anymore. Um, one little thing to remember is just one teaspoon of salt is enough to bring five gallons of water up to that chronic exposure limit. So I said that salt has an impact on those aquatic organisms. This is, these are a couple of photos taken by Bill Hintz, who's a freshwater ecologist at the University of Toledo in Ohio, where they also have cold winters and they also put salt down on roads. And you can see here as fish are growing in um, water with a lot of road salt, it's impacting their growth and also the reproduction and just general health. I also mentioned that we see those kind of impacts up and down the food chain. So the zooplankton, you see the word zoo in there. So those are zoo like animals. So tiny, tiny little animals um, in our water. They're some of the first to be impacted by salt in the water. And as their populations go down, there's less food available or there's a negative impact on the planktivorous fish that eat those zooplankton. And if their populations go down, there's then a negative impact on the larger fish, like the ones people like to fish for as well. So we take away a food source that impacts the level above negatively, it impacts the, the next level at the top of the food chain. Going down, if you're removing your zooplankton, there aren't as many of them around to eat the algae, the algae populations are gonna go up. So it's kind of like a positive impact or increase in algae, unfortunately, that can make greener, murkier water that we don't necessarily like to be swimming or boating or playing in. Um, but if we have less algae, that's the food source for the benthic organisms, you're going to have fewer of those. So it really can just wreak havoc throughout the food chain in a freshwater ecosystem. These are just some pictures showing those concentrations of salt um, increasing over time. And you might say, well, Allison, you just told me that if we have more salt, we're gonna have murkier water. So that's due to the al algal populations going up as zooplankton go away. But also as we increase salt, we have less of um, a kind of macro algae that's actually a habitat for fish. So if, as we increase the amount of salt, we have less habitat for some of the very small fish or small fish, I should say young fish that are gonna grow. So impacting both the food chain as well as impacting the habitat. So as I said before, we do see chloride concentrations again in those milligrams per liter. Here you see that the dark purple is what we should have naturally, dark to maybe some of that light purple but throughout a lot of Wisconsin, not just in the southern part of the state, but most intensely in the southeastern part of Wisconsin, we're seeing those concentrations climb up into the tens, the hundreds, and even the, the thousands of milligrams per liter. So again, once we get into this orange zone, we're getting above the limit that 
organisms can tolerate. Freshwater, I should say freshwater organisms can tolerate well. This is some data from the Yahara lakes, which are the, um, the main chain of lakes in our capital Dane, in Wisconsin and Dane County, sorry, Madison, Dane County. And so you can see here those concentrations since we started putting road salt down in the 1950s have increased fairly steadily. If you spent time around um, UW-Madison, Madison area, you probably recognize the name Mendota. That's the largest lake just to the north of UW campus. And as the largest in the chain of lakes, it has the greatest ability for dilution. So it's salts coming in, there's a lot of water, so the concentrations can stay lower. And then as we move our way up to smaller lakes, like Lake Wingra is the smallest. So as salt comes into Wingra, there's less dilution potential. And so concentrations rise faster. You also probably see that in the Lake Wingra data, there's a lot more variability kind of year to year. And that's due to different winters um, with maybe more storms or more ice and more salt going down. So in a way, it's kind of promising that we do see that variability year to year because the lake itself, it doesn't, it, the water there isn't, isn't there permanently, right? The water kind of flushes out of the system. And so we do have um, the ability to kind of reset the water that's in there and have that salt kind of flush out with the water, um, which, which is hopeful, right? For our freshwater lakes. Um, the lakes can have all the impacts that I shared with you before kind of in the food chain. Um, and then there's another concern when we have salt in our lakes. Um, I'm gonna break down the term cultural, meaning like from people. And then marrow mixes is like not mixing. So lakes naturally turn over seasonally. And when that happens, they reset the nutrients and the oxygen um, levels throughout the lake that mixing is important to the health of the ecosystem. But as we have more salt building up, salt is heavy, salt water is heavier than fresh water. And so that salty water sinks down to the bottom and it makes it more difficult and less likely that the lakes are gonna flip. In some cases, thankfully not in Wisconsin yet, but this has been seen in New York state and there are signs of it in some Lake Michigan lakes, or sorry, not Lake Michigan, in the state of Michigan and their lakes that Due to human influence, human salt inputs, we're seeing um, less mixing in our lakes. And then again, those salts come from winter, road salt, um, inefficient water softeners or water softeners, and chlorides that come in our fertilizers as well. Unfortunately, we're also starting to see salts accumulate in our groundwater. And for most of Wisconsin, our groundwater is our drinking water. So you can see in the Madison area, these are Madison municipal wells because there's a lot of great data that's been collected in, in Madison. We have an increase in the, the average. So this line in the middle of the graph is the average. You see that average increasing. And then in our little whisker up at the top, this is the um, one well that's well above the average. Um, it is increasing um, up to 140 milligrams per liter fairly recently. And the understanding is from the water utility that this well here, it's well 14 right along University Avenue of Maine thoroughfare in Madison, that the water there is gonna start tasting salty to the average citizen in about 10 years. Um, some people who are a little bit more sensitive to like taste and smell say that they, it tastes salty to them already. Um, and here you see this is water that's being pulled from both the upper and the lower aquifer. So just like water coming up from the well. And then they're also able to pull water just from the lower aquifers. So even farther down beneath the surface. And, you know, you'd expect that salt, it takes a while for salt to move down and maybe it wouldn't be making its way to those lower aquifers, but it's showing up in the lower aquifers as well. And we're also seeing a, a slight increase in the concentrations of salt at those lower levels. So just digging your well deeper isn't gonna solve your problem. And there are other um, reasons why the water utility doesn't wanna be pulling water from those deeper wells. 
Again, this is not just a problem in Madison. We see these inputs of chloride throughout the state and um, it's showing up in our groundwater. This map came from UW Stevens Point Well Water Viewer. This is available online. Anybody can go on and make up a map of a lot of different things that are in our water. You could look at bacteria, atrazine, you can look at water hardness. I chose to look at chloride. And we can see here from the kind of brighter green throughout the state, some of the yellow that we're seeing in our groundwater and our drinking water wells, um, increased levels of chloride from 10 to 50 in the yellow areas, 50 to 100. And since this data is shown by township, I tried to zoom in, but you can't do that and look at the whole state at the same time. So I took just one county here, Wood County, which is in central Wisconsin. So not a super urban county, but you can see that where these were those yellow dots, if we zoom in on those, we see that some of the little sections actually have data with red. So that's telling us chloride measurements above 200 milligrams per liter. So big idea is that salt is a problem throughout the state, not just in Madison, not just in our very urban areas. Um, it's showing up in our surface water and it's showing up even in our groundwater. So Wisconsin SaltWise, as I mentioned at the very beginning, started in Dane County. It was a collection of organizations from the water utility, the city um, sewerage district, the county itself, other municipalities that were all increasingly concerned with that increase of salt concentration in our water. And they said, we need to do something about this. So they've um, been working the last several years to provide training opportunities for anybody who puts salt down. So municipal, private, public, um, winter maintenance professionals, anybody who would use a shovel and maybe throw some salt down um, in a parking lot, on sidewalks, on our streets. Last year when I started working with SaltWise, I worked to connect with anybody across the state who is leading similar programs. So Waukesha County, the Fox Wolf Watershed, the City of Superior, and the Root Pike in your neck of the woods um, with Nan Calvert. They've all been leading similar classes, um, Milwaukee River Keepers and Rain to Rivers up around Eau Claire. And I wanted to hear how those classes were going, who they were connecting with, and find out ways that we can all work together to amplify this message, a unified message around salt. I worked last fall to write a very large grant um, for the Fund for Lake Michigan, and they were willing to fund me to help take the message of SaltWise statewide. So that's what I'm doing this year. So as I mentioned, um, one of the big things that SaltWise focuses on is training those winter maintenance professionals. We've had over 700 individuals participate in the City of Madison trainings. And just in the last couple of months, I've gotten another almost 100 people trained. So these training programs are free for any winter maintenance professionals, thanks to the grant. Um, I'm also working to celebrate communities and private companies that are doing great work around salt use. A lot of the people who go through our program and who, if they get engaged and they work to adopt those best management practices are reducing their salt use upwards of 50% and more. It's, it's really incredible what can, they can do when they start really thinking about salt use. And then part of my outreach is to work to change our norms around salt. We need to stop people from thinking more is better, right? We need people to recognize that salt has real costs to our environment, um, costs beyond um, the pocketbook. And part of that is we want to shovel first. We don't just want to burn snow off with salt. Try to get as much snow and ice up as you can. And then if you do need to salt, just scatter it. People tend to think they need more salt. If things aren't melting right away, they think add more. Um, when sometimes you just need to wait and give salt time to do its job. And if it's really cold like it was the last couple of weeks, we want to switch. We don't want to keep using salt because if it's below 15 degrees, salt's not effective. 
So we wanna switch over to sand. So the idea is getting people to use the right tools, um, remove that snow mechanically if possible and just use salt on an as needed basis. So here's a little snapshot from our website and some of the classes um, that we have. I'm, I'm proud to say that our class on the 23rd, we've capped um, with over 100 participants. I'm also working to develop a lot of different resources on our website. I am the only um, staff member at SaltWise and I use a lot of, get a lot of support from other organizations and volunteers across the state. So if any of you are interested in helping out, that'd be great. Um, but we're just trying to make SaltWise a resource um, for everybody. One of the events I was able to host last fall, although I had to keep it pretty small due to COVID, um, was an equipment open house. So we got people from the city and the county, um, early adopters that have invested in new equipment or improvements to their equipment like brooms. If there's just a little bit of snow, just brush it away and you don't need salt. Or switching over to the use of some salt brine, which can be used before the storm. Brine works like kind of like oil does in your skillet. So if you oil your skillet before cracking your egg, you can grab your spatula and scoop that egg up nice and easy, right? But if you don't put oil down and you are cooking your egg or your food in your skillet and then you're trying to scrape it, you're scraping and you're scraping and it's stuck there, right? The egg or the food has made a bond with your skillet. The same thing happens with snow. If we can get a little bit of brine down before the snow, when the snow comes down, the plows can come through and scrape that snow up and use a lot less salt afterwards. So here's a success story from the, um, my town, Middleton, just outside of Madison. They were able to certify all of their municipal streets crew members through the SaltWise program taking that four hour, like I said, free class. Right now they're virtual. And they also were able to make some investments in newer equipment, um, namely here, a type of truck that brings that liquid brine in and mixes it with the salt before it spins down onto the road. The idea of mixing the liquid with the solid rock salt means that it's activated and it can start melting sooner. And it's also, as the salt comes down, going to stick in place and not bounce. The DOT has done studies and about 30% of salt bounces off the road and isn't effective. It's not actually melting anything if it's bounced off the road and into the ditch. It's just damaging our environment. So that's one thing is we can encourage and try to support those equipment upgrades, which tend to really pay back as the city of Middleton has reduced their salt use by over 50%. Another success story a little closer to you guys is Cudahy, just south of Milwaukee. They've reduced their salt use by 70%, practically 69.9. And again, you see training in there as a part of that, um, that incorporation of brine, but also equipment calibration, which is key and equipment calibration doesn't involve investing in new equipment. It really just means calibrating to figure out how much salt is going down on setting one, two, three, or maybe how much salt, salt is actually going down when your truck says it's putting down a hundred pounds per lane mile. Is that how much is going down or is it putting down 300? You can see before calibration, the truck was putting down 850 pounds. After calibration, they brought it down to 300 for a given setting. So just using calibration alone, Kadehe reduced salt use by 50%. Here's a success story with a local company, the Bruce Company, that is land, does landscaping in the summer and winter, you know, snow removal in the winter. And they also have reduced salt use by over 50% through those big ideas, training, calibration, using some brine. Those are three of our best management practices for winter snow removal. Oh, I put in some DOT success stories here. So our state is also um, working on this. I think we've got 72, is it 72 counties in Wisconsin? Um, 
So 55 of them, the majority of them have been decreasing salt use. And that is measured according to winter severity. So it's not just that, you know, one winter it's there are fewer storms or less ice that DOT actually measures it according to a, an index of winter severity. And you can see here, some counties have significantly reduced salt use. Um, Jefferson County between Madison and Milwaukee has reduced it by almost 70%. And those savings in salt the DOT has calculated has saved them and um, therefore saved you, the taxpayers, over $8 million in the salt bill. So Wisconsin SaltWise is trying to share these successes on our social media through social media um, SaltWise shoutouts. Also, we love shouting out what individuals are doing. Here is um, Caitlin, she's got her little Milwaukee kayak um, hat on. So she uh, was a Saltwise fan. She lives in Milwaukee, right by Lake Michigan. You can see in the background there and on a, um, a walk or something, she saw a little salt spill. I shouldn't say little. She measured it. There were like 40 cups of salt. And I took a picture, had a friend take a picture of her, sent it in to share. And I did the calculations, those, or sorry, I should say 80 cups of salt, excuse me. Um, if they would have ended up in Lake Michigan, would have polluted 19,000 gallons of water. And that's using that one teaspoon to five gallons ratio. So love selling um, or celebrating um, those successes. And then here I've grabbed a little screenshot of some social um, shout outs during Salt Awareness Week. We got some great publicity from the um, Wausau News. So again, Salt Awareness Week happened in January, but if you missed it, all of those talks, their little half hour webinars are available on YouTube. We've archived them. Also put up here a couple of fun memes. I think we've got a maybe a teenager, some preteens in the audience. So maybe you can laugh at these and explain to your parents what's going on. Um, so trying to get the word out any way I can through presentations um, to local youth organizations, um, DNR pre presented to Middleton Sustainability Committee, really anybody who will listen. Um, try to encourage people to go to our website, which is was down today for a short period of time and I, I hope it's back up, but please be patient if it, if it is down and when you check it out tonight. Um, I'm putting together a map of all the private companies that are SaltWise certified. Right now, the names that I have are mainly in the Madison area, but I'm working to get um, together a database of everybody who's taken the training from anyone. But we've got a lot of different res um, outreach tools on there. If you want to, you know, go around and help put some door hangers up in your community, print out pamphlets, share um, information via email. We have a lot of templates on there as well as some videos. So a few things that you can do in your community are to make sure that you are demonstrating um, using the right tools to get as much um, snow ice up without salt. So as I mentioned, brooms can be really effective if there's a small amount of snow. Um, obviously, we can just take our shovel or snow blowers um, and try to get out there early and often so we can avoid that compaction. And then this is a really cool tool, the ultimate scraper. It's a little pricey, but I did get one of these to just get under that ice and just scrape it up. Um, it's pretty satisfying. You can also use it to chop through the ice too. Um, another big idea for all of us is to remember that a set amount of ice, or excuse me, a set amount of salt met, will melt a set amount of ice. And one coffee cup like this, 12 ounce coffee cup, is enough for about 20 um, feet of driveway or like 10 sidewalk squares. So you really can have those salt crystals spaced out and just give them time to work. Um, one fun way to say that is we want our salt crystals to be socially distanced. Another idea that I shared earlier is sweeping up the salt. Um, I've done this, some of this myself, along um, business kind of strips and um, just trying to model that, that this is something we actually care about. So 
I am going to jump into a little bit of a discussion about water softeners, but I thought I'd take a break here and see if anybody has questions about winter salt use. You can ask them or put them into the chat. I think I can. Let's for a minute. Questions, comments, maybe something that was new that you hadn't thought of before. I have a question. This is Gina. Um, how does the brine not contribute to the problem? That's a good question, Gina. So the brine um, still is salt. So I'm not mm -hmm. going to say it doesn't contribute, um, but it drastically can reduce the amount of salt that's used. So brine is generally um, just 23.3% salt to water. When I say salt, I'm saying sodium chloride. Sometimes um, like the DOT might be, you know, like perfecting little recipes, depending on the temperature, the pavement temperature, they might be adding some magnesium chloride or calcium chloride. Now they're all chlorides. So it's all chloride ending up in our water. But calcium and magnesium chloride have lower, um, or they can lower the melting point even more. They're more expensive. So we tend to use sodium chloride. It's the cheapest right. way, right? To lower the, the melting point. But what um, the DOT and these municipalities are seeing is really that benefit of like getting that, that oil done on your skillet first, right? Um, if you have that down and you can get that food up really, really easily, if you can get that snow up really easily, you're not spending that time scraping and scraping and dumping salt and more salt and more salt to try to get the snow that's been compacted into ice afterwards. Okay, so basically it, it helps so that you're not using more salt on top then. So you can yes. get off. So yeah. it, it actually does reduce the, the rot, like rock salt use. Okay, thank yes. you. Yes. So thanks, yeah, thanks for that question. So it's, it you are still putting salt down, but it's like much less, it's um, being proactive about it. And there are some um, places, like some counties, some municipalities that are like really advanced because there's, there's a lot of learning. There's a lot more learning involved when putting brine down. If you do it wrong, you could, you know, create super icy conditions. Mm. Um, but if you can, you know, learn that process and get your mix right, some people are transitioning to using brine even during the storm. It's called direct liquid applications or DLA, um, but that's definitely more advanced. So we don't, as SaltWise, we don't say you have to do it this way, you have to do it that way. We're trying to provide people with a menu of options, best sure. management practices, um, and letting them figure out what works for their community. Okay. I do see we have a question come in, came in from the chat. It looks like Patty for homeowners are products with magnesium chloride the best um, without endorsing any brands. What are some of the most common to look for? So I would say for homeowners, you're probably best off with sodium chloride, NaCl. Um, it is the least expensive. And like I said, both magnesium chloride and calcium chloride, they still have chloride in them. Um, so there really though, there are no environmentally friendly de-icers. So mm -hmm. even if it says like environmentally friendly or pet friendly, like de-icers aren't. Um, even sand, you know, it's not salt, but if we put a lot of sand down that causes sedimentation in our streams and our lakes, which isn't great either. So mechanical removal, getting out there with your shovel, with your scraper is always best. Um, but we acknowledge that there are times where people are gonna need to use that de-icer. And so we would just try to, you know, minimize the use of it, use just what's needed. Um, magnesium and calcium chloride can have some other impacts to ecosystems as well. They can be kind of damaging um, and they're more expensive. But another piece I would add in there is there are no truth and labeling laws around de-icers. So de-icers can say pet friendly and they're not. <laughs> De-icers can say environmentally friendly. They can say, um, you know, melts down to negative 50 degrees Fahrenheit, and they don't, right? But there are no laws in place to regulate that. So 
Um, it's unfortunate and that's something that I want to work on with SaltWise, but, um, and I will tell you later, I am going to try to do some work um, with our current legislature, just knowing that that is a slow process. So any other questions, feel free to put them in on the chat or chime in. Um, but I think I'll keep going here and talk a little bit about water softeners. Would people mind sharing, like, do you have a water softener at home? No. No? Does anybody? I think in Kenosha, do you, is your home water coming from the lake? Would that be why? Do you know where your municipal water comes from? I'm out in summers actually, so mine's from a well. <laughs> okay. Nice. Um, all right. Well, I'll just maybe kind of go briefly over water softeners. Yeah. So city water. I'm wondering, does your city water is it um it's Lake Michigan? Yep. Okay. So you guys um are kind of lucky in that if your water's coming from the lake. Um, it's unlike the water here in Madison, um, it's not going to necessarily be hard. Um, the water in a large part of the state, and I'll show you a map in a minute, that's been sitting in a limestone aquifer. So limestone is calcium carbonate, or sometimes if it's dolomitic limestone, it's calcium magnesium carbonate. When it sits in that rock, it can end up pulling up some of the calcium and the magnesium. Um, in the water and so people use water softeners. So I'll just kind of go through this a little more quickly since it's not as relevant to all of you but to know it is a problem, um, an additional input of chloride into our water in other parts of the state. So in the Madison area or like I said a good portion of the state as you go around to different gas stations, you'll see giant bags of salt. Um, and are outside of hardware stores as well. And a lot of people are taking those and putting them into their water softeners. This is actually my water softener down in my basement. Um, three tanks here, it's a little more efficient than some of them, but um, still I did not know until I started this job that all the salt I put in my water softener here in the brine tank goes to our wastewater treatment plant where it doesn't get removed. So for each of you, you could think of like any salt that you put down your drain, um, whether it be salt that you've eaten and is going out via your toilet or um, any salt that you use for whatever purpose, once it's down the drain and it goes to the wastewater treatment plant, they can't remove that salt from the water. The sodium and the chloride ions are so tiny that it would, they'd have to like run reverse osmosis on all of the wastewater to be able to pull that out. And it's not practical. It costs way too much money and your sewer rates would go up like five times is what the city of Madison has uh, determined. So this map here in um, the dark blue, you can see areas where the water is hard. Now hard water, you know, it's just regular water it would look like it to each of us but it has those little ions of calcium and magnesium in that, in it, which can end up leaving your hair kind of more dry, or it might end up putting a scale on your appliances and people don't want that. So they soften it by using those water softeners. So in the dark blue areas where we have more hard groundwater, the wastewater treatment plants um, here marked here by orange dots, those are all wastewater treatment plants that are discharging chloride, discharging that chloride from salt that came in from the softeners. Um, and they're putting more into our streams than the DNR says is okay. But the DNR recognizes that taking that chloride out would cost so much money that the DNR has said, okay, this is not good, but we'll let you keep doing it. We just want you to be aware you're doing it and try to do some education around it. So that's where we're at right now. We're like kind of stuck with our hands tied because people don't see a great solution to this. And one of them that I wanna promote is just increasing that awareness that this is a problem. So 
People can work to only soften the water they need. They can make sure their water softeners one, run really efficiently. And there are some salt-free technologies out there. So I said I'd go through this kind of quickly since it's not as relevant for all of you. But um, for me, when my water comes in it to the house, it has that calcium and magnesium in it and the softener works to remove it and send replace it with sodium ions. So the water that goes through my shower can be soft and the water that goes through my hot water heater um, through my dishwasher is softened water. It doesn't cause that scale and it allows those appliances to last longer. But when that happens, all the calcium and magnesium that got pulled out along with the chloride goes to the wastewater treatment plant and the sodium, of course, from the shower goes there as well. And the wastewater treatment plant can't remove them. So things we can do, get rid of those really old water softeners. If they're softening according to a set number of days, it's like they recharge every two or three or four days. It would kind of be like if you guys had a car that you emptied the gas out of every Sunday and refilled the gas tank to full, regardless of how much you'd driven the car and what the gas tank was at, okay? You would never do that, but that's what these old water softeners do. They just stop and they're like, well, seven days have gone by. You probably used up your soft water, so let's just reset the whole system again. We want to get rid of those. Um, like I mentioned, working to only soften hot water, make sure people aren't putting salt on their, you know, their plants in their yard. Um, we don't need to soften. Um, if we're wasting water, if we got drips, you know, in our kitchen or wherever, that's water that's being wasted. We don't need to soften toilet water, um, mainly just softening the water going through the hot water heater, protecting that appliance. So people can work to optimize their softeners, call in a professional. And that's all I'll say about softeners, but you can ask me questions about them. And I would also say, I would love your support if you want to um, be a SaltWise champion in your community by adopting those best management practices of getting out there with your shovel, um, getting snow up, using winter salt minimally. You can also help by spreading the word. I have some sweep the salt door hangers and I can work to get some of those out to you in Kenosha, probably via the Root Pike watershed. And you can go kind of share some of those and help spread the word, not the salt. Um, also, you can like us on social media and boost our kind of posts on Facebook, on Twitter. You can enjoy some of the public art um, we, right now we have a, a water softener mural at the Henry Vilas Zoo in Madison. It's soon going to be out at one of the lakes. And we have helped to promote salt via public art or salt awareness via public art at um, Garver Feed Mill through the Winter is Alive event, which is coming up. Actually, I think it's available online right now. Um, also, if you wanted to make a trip to Madison, there are outdoor like sculptures, art installations, but you can visit the website and see some of them there as well. You can also work to, or volunteer to do some chloride monitoring at local streams in your community and help promote our trainings. The one on February 23rd, I think I mentioned it, it's full. We've got like a hundred people signed up, which is great. We've got another one coming up on March 12th. This particular training is geared towards municipal plow drivers, anybody who's gonna be potentially salting on roads. And then I also had mentioned that we are doing some work, I am doing some work around on legislation and trying to get some li limited liability protection in place so that if a private company, private winter maintenance company has sent their crew to one of our trainings and is documenting when they are using salt, how much salt they're using and being responsible about that, um, using best management practices that they would not be sued. Um, that's what we're running into is one of the big kind of reasons people fall back on to over salting is that if there was a slip and fall accident, the first question that they're asked is, was salt visible? on the pavement. So people feel like you have to make sure you see salt, meaning there's extra salt left over when the snow and ice is gone 
but that's a sign that it's salted and people have done due diligence. Um, we don't want that to be the mindset anymore. And also working to increase um, softener efficiency standards throughout the state. So with that, I've got a photo here from uh, the, one of the videos that's going to be shown through the Winter is Alive exhibit. And a couple of photos showing the transformation of a water softener into some public art um, that's now out at the park and will soon be at um, Lake Wingra. So with that, um, I can take any questions if you have them. All right, looks like we've got a question in the chat and others can feel free to use the chat as well if that feels more comfortable. Um, is disposal of extra pavement salt or even disposal of unused old kitchen salt and the garbage acceptable? So, I mean, acceptable, I would say it's, it's best if we can um, reuse that salt. So if you have extra pavement salt, I know sometimes it's hard to like store that and maybe it you know, gets kind of frozen and clumps up. The city of Hopkins, Minnesota ran a salt recycling program in their community where they just had a big bin at city hall, but maybe the library could be a place for this, um, this winter, where if people did have homeowners, um, any apartment, you know, people in apartments, anybody that would have a bag of pavement salt, if you have extra at the end of the season, instead of throwing that away into our landfills where it would eventually kind of run through, um, if it you know gets dissolved in the landfill leachate, it's gonna move into our groundwater. Um, if we can get that salt and drop it off and then have the municipality take that, like the city of Hopkins took this extra salt from homeowners and they added it to their salt pile and then they could reuse it on roads. Because we really, what we really don't want is for people to, you know, say, oh, I only have a, a third of a bag, like I'll just really use that salt liberally and, and empty the bag out. Um, because it's all going into our water. And like I said, even if it goes to the landfill, it's getting into our water. So trying to know really that, yeah, any salt that you use is going into our water. It's going either into our groundwater or our surface water. It's just kind of what pathway is it taking to get there? 